Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Six Bridges Book Festival. I'm Steve Stracely. I am the principal of Catholic High School for Boys here in Little Rock, and I'm a sometimes uh, wannabe columnist for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. I'm uh, here in Midtown Little Rock, broadcasting live from an empty school building. But you may hear the roar of uh, the crowd just down the road at War Memorial Stadium as the Arkansas Razorbacks take on uh, the UAPB Golden Lions in just a moment. For those of you viewing this session, please don't forget if you have a question, you may enter it into the chat box and we will do our best to, uh, to get to those questions. Now, this morning, I have the great honor of uh, being with these uh, authors, Amber Edwards, Justin Scott, and Ronna Weaver, who wrote two great books that I've enjoyed thoroughly. First, we have Amber Edwards and Justin Scott's book, 40 Days and 40 Nights. It's the tale of a uh, Army Corps of Engineers officer named Clementine Price, who battles the raging, flooding Mississippi River, in addition to a domestic terrorist who has this plot to create civil war uh, on top of the uh, natural disaster. Wonderful thriller. And then we have Ronna Weaver's book, A Noble Calling, also a thriller of sorts in that it is about a uh, young FBI agent named Wynn Tyler who is assigned to Yellowstone Park and he stumbles across this diabolical plan by uh, some militiamen to create a disturbance at a Jewish monument dedication that will lead to a more sinister agenda. Both books are very difficult to put down. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, the, uh, both books have great scenery. The Mississippi River is its own character in Amber and Justin's book, and Yellowstone Park is its own character in Rana's book, and just a wonderful read. And uh, both available at Wordsworth Books, uh, one of our uh, sponsors. Now, let's start with Amber and Justin. So Amber is a noted documentary filmmaker who has directed, written, and produced 19 documentaries for PBS. And Justin is the author of 37 thriller mysteries and sea stories, uh, including the Isaac Bell series that he wrote with Clive Cussler. This is Amber and Justin's first collaboration as husband and wife, and we will get to that uh, shortly. Uh, and <laughs> We're in the that, same room. <laughs> <laughs> still talking to one another. So. Uh, and you guys are coming to us from uh, Connecticut. Now, 40 Days and 40 Nights has a lot of action and scenery within it. Uh, could you guys start by reading a passage for us, please? Uh, yes, we'll, we'll each read a brief passage um, in the... First uh, several pages of the book, we meet both our hero, Clementine Price, and our villain. I'll be the hero, and Justin will be the villain. <laughs> <laughs> it's that husband wife the regular <laughs> habit around the house. It took too long to get everyone in the trucks. Clementine Price's father and her brother were arguing they'd seen higher water all the years when she was off at West Point. Her mother and her sister in law were struggling to herd cows into the cattle truck the kids howling to take their animals with them in the dump truck. Uncle Chance, a spray pilot who'd made Clementine his crop dusting partner when she turned 14, pointed at a stream of muddy water trickling through the trees. The Mississippi is topping its bank, he shouted. The river would wheel toward that weak spot like a hungry snake. To punctuate him, a boil shot up a geyser of mud 200 yards away. Dogs, cats, a calf, and a favorite pig were slung into the trucks. Clementine, get in! She was staring at the tin roof open hangar where Uncle Chance parked his air tractor, a hardworking, sturdy yellow spray plane nearly twice her age. She'd named it Snoopy when she was little for its long nose that housed the chemical hopper. They were about to lose the crop to a flood and her army pay was already stretched to the limit of helping out. The spray plane would bring in cash. Get in the truck, hun. Feels too soft. That mud will never turn her wheels loose. I'll take off from the driveway. Drive on. The Price family tore out, spraying water and gravel, and she ran to the hangar. Rain thundered on the tin roof. She undid tie-down ropes, kicked chocks from the wheels, grabbed the big propeller with both hands, and spun it three turns to expel oil from the cylinders. 
She folded her long legs into Snoopy's cockpit and was reaching for the throttle and the starter when she heard a roar so loud it seemed to rumble out of the earth itself. Four of the tall trees that crowned the riverbank were tumbling as if mowed down by a colossal brush hog. The earth under them appeared to melt. The ground shook the airplane. The natural levee was collapsing into the field that it guarded. Clementine cranked the engine for 20 seconds, backed off, cranked again, got it started, and idled it at 600 RPMs. Until the oil was warm enough to lubricate the supercharger, Snoopy was going nowhere. She used the warm-up time to check that rudder, trim controls, and flaps were moving freely, buckled in, and tugged Uncle Chance's helmet onto her head. The river slithered into the gap between the trees. The water accelerated and scoured a channel wider than a house. More trees fell. The oil temp gauge edged toward 40 degrees centigrade. Clementine throttled out of the hangar into the rain and taxied the plane across the soggy grass toward the hard gravel. The river exploded with sudden ferocity, tearing a hole 100 feet wide. Water poured onto the Price Farm and snatched the ground under her wheels. She looked back and wished she hadn't. A crest like an ocean wave rose above the water and tumbled white across the field, chasing the little plane straining to reach the hard gravel. She retracted her flaps, increased fuel mixture to full rich, and advanced her throttle. Now she was rolling down the driveway, picking up speed, gravel rattling the fuselage and banging the propeller. The tailwheel rose as she passed her parents' house. She passed her father's machine shop, the smokehouse, the old mule barn, the chicken coop, the hog pen full of sows and piglets. She passed her brother's little ranch house, passed Uncle Chance's trailer. A 30-foot utility pole at the sharp end in the driveway was coming up fast. Drive on, thought Clementine Price, and poured on the power. A pause to just, <laughs> to, to, to just absorb that. <laughs> <laughs> he All did right. a good job. Good luck. Jim. <laughs> the correctional officers gave the fat old inmate shovels. The young ones had to hump 80 pound canvas bags of wet sand up a steep slope and stack them on top of the levee, which was already taller than a rich man's house. It was raining like a son of a bitch and the wind blew the rain even harder. Nathan Flowers figured it wouldn't take long for the guards to be smoking cigarettes inside the bus. What he hadn't reckoned on was how far it was anywhere to run to. Nothing inside the levees, but miles of flat empty fields. Outside was the Mississippi River, roaring like a thousand log trucks. Whatever was across it could be on the moon for all he could see. But all of a sudden, out of all that nothing, the river brought him a present. A square shadow swooped through the rain straight at him. The other prisoners fled down the slope, but Nathan Flowers stood his ground and watched it come with eyes clearer than he had ever possessed. He saw a huge old boat, gray and rust streaked, three stories high and a hundred feet long, and pictured in his mind that when it hit the levee, it would scatter sandbags, bust a wide hole and slide down the slope into the field. The river would follow, mountains of river, stomping the land, like a crazy giant. But the river had another idea. Instead of smashing the levee, the boat touched the sandbags at his feet, light as a kiss. For one second, it was possible to step on it like stepping onto grandma's porch. The river snatched it back into the current and took Nathan Flowers for a ride. It was dark inside, cold and strangely quiet. Nathan climbed some stairs and found himself in a room full of instruments surrounded by windows. This is what they called a wheelhouse, except there was no wheel, just a big old leather chair with a couple of sticks on either side. Out the windows was rain and river in every direction. Suddenly, a an engine started with a distant roar deep in the boat. The deck vibrated under his feet. An old man in greasy overalls came stomping up the stairs. His hair was pasted on the side of his head like he'd slept on it. His eyes were red, and he stank of whiskey. Night watchman, guessed Nathan Flowers fell asleep drunk and woke up to a big surprise. The watchman saw Nathan in his prison greens and pawed at his pistol. Nathan sank a fist in the watchman's eye, pounded him with both hands, grabbed him by his shirt and slammed his head repeatedly against a steel pillar. He had been winning fights since the Arkansas Juvenile Assessment and Treatment Center and this one-sided match was over in seconds. He threw the body down the stairs head first. The drunk fell down drunk. Look how bunged up his head is. The engine stopped as quick as it had started. 
damn fool, lousy drunk, hadn't started it right. And if things weren't bad enough, a huge boat was suddenly coming alongside with soldiers throwing ropes. Nathan raced down the stairs and jumped in the water with his alibi full blown in his mind. The boat knocked me in the water when it hit the levee. I was washed downstream. No, sir, I was not escaping. I was knocked in the water. He figured to drift out of sight, then swim to the shore. But the current was so cold he couldn't breathe and it sucked him under. He fought it with all his strength, realizing too late when the water stung his nose and rammed his throat that he was fighting for his life, tumbled and pummeled like he was a carcass that he'd thrown to the hogs. And now you folks at home know why I got hooked on this book <laughs> right on the front end of it. Just such a great start, but obviously now we know who the heroine and the villain are in, in the whole marriage and the writing process, right? So, uh, that's great, great stuff. Now, Amber, um, you, uh, uh, this is the, based on uh, a story of an Arkansas cousin. It was the only documentary you didn't finish. Now, can you tell us who the, don't tell us the name of the Arkansas cousin, because here in Arkansas, we know everybody. So, <laughs> but uh, tell us about that documentary and how it led to this. Well, actually, none of the, uh, none of the villainous or heroic uh, main characters were any of my relatives. Um, the, what was inspiring to me um, there is a there is a um, a supporting character who I will freely admit was my cousin, the character Steve Stevenson, who was my cousin Steve Stevens. And um, what what inspired me is the setting. So that little part of Arkansas, my mother grew up in Dell, Arkansas, population three hundred and twenty five is right there, and and that's this neighborhood. Um, and I spent a lot of time uh, down there. Justin came along sometimes as a as a grip, trying to make this uh, story about Steve, and it was too complicated. But I just was so mesmerized by the setting. And Steve was one of those people uh, we like to say he had a tire size Rolodex, and he opened. I mean, doors were just wide open. We met people of every single walk of life, and we were kind of granted access to the window into this world. And it, it seemed like a great setting for a thriller, especially when you have the Mississippi River as, as you said, one of the main characters. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right, you know, in a small town, you don't have to know someone, you just have to know the guy who knows someone. Right? Exactly. <laughs> well, exactly. that's that's wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, now to Little Rock's own Ronna Weaver. Ronna was a swamp and farmland appraiser uh, for 35 years before settling in to write this great debut novel. Uh, her husband, Bill Temple, is a retired deputy assistant director of the FBI, and he uh, Rana says was a huge source uh, of research for a noble calling. So Rana, could you please uh, read a passage uh, from a noble calling for us? All right, thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Thanks so much for this opportunity. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to reading the other thriller where uh, 40 Days and 40 Nights, that just sounds fabulous. And I know exactly where Dell is, having done <laughs> swampland appraising and farmland yes, appraising exactly. for 35 years, yes. Uh, I'm going to read um, the beginning of my book. Uh, it's titled A Noble Calling. Uh, the title is, is reflective of my belief that the people that service in law enforcement, the FBI agents, the park rangers, the policemen, they serve a noble calling. And the book is about a young FBI agent who um, really through no fault of his own ends up exiled to Yellowstone National Park where uh, no FBI agent wants to be because we all know nothing ever happens in uh, the national parks. But uh, I'm going to read from the uh, chapter one. No, this day hadn't gone well from the get go, even before the red and blue lights swirled in the rearview mirror. He'd driven the last 176 miles from Billings in an early April snowstorm, not the thing a southern boy handled real well. The low hanging clouds were as dark as his mood. Just a few months ago, this spring had held such promise. 
the opportunity to move up the ladder a notch to a prize posting at the Bureau's New Orleans field office. So much white collar crime and corruption in that city, it'd be like shooting fish in a barrel. The perfect posting for an up and coming agent ready to make a name for himself. Reasonably close to home and SEC football, not a bad city to start a family. And then there was that. How had it fallen apart with Shelby? Had they been too focused on the job? Had med school consumed her passion? Had they, sir, I need to see your license. Wynn heard the muffled voice through the frosty window. He hit the power button and the window dropped. The blowing snow and frigid air rushed inside as he struggled to form a coherent response. Standing in a near whiteout wasn't improving the ranger's mood. When he had to ask again, there was no sir. I need to see your license. Do you know how fast you were going? The park is a 45 mile per hour zone. 45 out here, uh, maybe 55, Wynn stammered. Well, try 65. That's borderline reckless driving here. Step out of the vehicle, sir. The cool blue eyes under the smoky the bear hat didn't look a bit friendly. The ranger was near Wynn's height and probably just past middle age. The close cropped gray hair under his flat hat gave him a military bearing and a deep scowl conveyed his thoughts. He clearly wasn't pleased with Wynn's lack of awareness. Wynn stepped out of his 10 year old SUV and the wind cut completely through his jean jacket. The tall man in green now had a hostile stance that matched his tone Got your truck crammed full? One of the seasonal employees working in the park, are you? Guess you didn't notice the big 45 mile per hour sign at the entrance. Or maybe you didn't notice you'd entered Yellowstone National Park, not paying a lot of attention, are you? The condescending lecture was jarring. No wind thought, this isn't going well at all. Another man in green approached from the other side of Wind's Explorer and leaned against the hood seemingly oblivious to the snow dancing across it. He casually rested his glove left hand on the truck, but the wariness in his alert eyes contradicted his easygoing approach. The man's thin smile showed no warmth. Wynn knew his right hand was resting on his weapon. He was maybe in his early 40s and much smaller than the first rangers. 5'11 or so, but he moved with a quiet confidence that demanded respect. Self-pity and lack of sleep aside, Wynn quickly realized it was time to snap out of it or things could go downhill fast. He sucked in an icy breath and shifted his eyes back to the tall older ranger. Sir, I'm sorry I was speeding. I'm Wynn Tyler, the agent assigned to the park's FBI satellite office. I just drove in from, well, isn't that special? Hear that, Gus? This boy is the new Fed they've assigned us. Where's that ID, son? Let's see. He looked at the gold badge, then flipped open Wynn's credentials. Hmm, says Special Agent Winston R. Tyler, coming to Mammoth from, hot, let's see, a license says Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina, moving to the wilderness from the big city. What did you screw up to get shipped out here? And that's how my novel begins. I love it. Ron, it, uh, one of the things that struck me about your novel, and I love books that do this, it just paints such a great picture. I just feel like I'm seeing what your main character is seeing. I'm feeling the frigid air. You do such a great job with the imagery. Later on, you know, I can almost hear the hot springs bubbling and feel that pound of bison footfalls in my chest so just i just wanted to compliment you on that as just one of the great things uh about your book but just one question to begin with how did you go from a self-described swamp and farmland appraiser to a novelist well when i was in fifth grade in independence county at south side um we had a wonderful teacher who gave us an assignment to write a novel. And during recess, a friend and I would sit there at lunchtime and recess. We wrote 30 pages of a manuscript for an adventure 
it was a girl our age who was, of course, after wrestlers and horses were involved. It was great fun. Wish I still had that. <laughs> and then honestly, I really didn't think about it again until sometime later. I wrote down in, on a notepad that we found years and years later that one of my goals in life, you know how you do when you're a child, was to, I think number three on the list, was to write a best-selling novel. Well, I'm part of the way there. So uh, <laughs> then I did 35 years of swampland and um, agricultural real estate appraisal here in Arkansas and through the South, primarily Mid-South. Uh, when I got ready to retire, I was looking at options. There were two wonderful options to do commercial real estate. And I decided to sit down and pray about it again one day back in late 2014 and just turned around and started writing this book and wrote the first chapter that day. So that's how it started. I can't tell you any more than that. It was kind of a mystery and a surprise to me as well. That's, that's awesome. Now, when you were appraising farmland or swampland, did you find yourself kind of describing it like, you know, the 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 green moss has an emerald tint to it? You know, the the descriptor, descriptors that you bring to bear in your book, did you kind of feel that all along uh, that you were going to write a novel? Well, I didn't plan to write a novel, but so many of my clients were uh, either foreign investors or folks in Manhattan, Boston. Um, San Francisco, and they needed a description of the land. So one of my beliefs in appraisal work is you need to describe what you're seeing. And that was, some of that was back before everything was digital. But uh, so the descriptive part, I probably did get from my technical writing. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, Amber and Justin, the million dollar question what is it like writing a book as a husband wife team <laughs> go joyous <laughs> <laughs> right answer amber tell us the truth now dear um no it really was it was it was tremendous fun and you know i i came to this as a as a novice uh novelist and um you know, I, Justin could not have been more, uh, you know, welcoming and generous. And, you know, rather than saying, why don't you write your own damn book? You know, he, he said, let's work on this together. Because I think possibly because I was throwing so many un, uh, unsolicited suggestions his way about the thing he was working on. Um, and I would say one of the, the big things that we learned about ourselves is um, I had uh, in making films for 30 years, you're constantly collaborating, you're constantly throwing, you know, half baked material out there and assuming that your collaborators will weigh in and, you know, make it better. And so you don't have a tremendous pride of authorship. It's just like, let's get something out there and then we can start shaping it. And Justin, I think, you know, over the years as a solitary novelist had kind of a different <laughs> approach to, I mean, we would divide up the, the book and I was like, okay, I'll do these scenes, you do these scenes. And I would come down like a little, you know, schoolgirl, like here are my five pages for the day. And, you know, we would bark them up and discuss them. And then, you know, for a while, Justin was not delivering any pages. <laughs> uh, old, old writer habit. Uh, don't let anything out of the house, particularly if you haven't written it yet. <laughs> uh, we, uh, if, we, if we brought anything different to the process, uh, Amber, I, I would credit her with a stronger work ethic than mine. Uh, her reaction to any situation is do something about it. And uh, spending my life making a living alone as a novelist, my reaction to the same situation is, well, let's wait a bit and see what happens. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe we'll get lucky one way or another. You know. uh, but in, 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 in seriously, uh, in the years, uh, publishing has changed a lot of the years I've written. And when I started out, we did collaborate in that we had real editors who had the time and inclination to work on a book with you. So you didn't really think you were completely alone. You know, I remember I would call an editor and I'd say, 
I'd say, I, I'm just like absolutely stuck. And, you know, there'd, there'd be some mumbling and cursing in the background about busy. And then he said, well, okay, meet me at the Palm for lunch. You know, <laughs> so go downtown to the Palm, have lunch together. You know, we'd work yeah. things out. Uh, that changed uh, as uh, publishing became more corporate. Um, the editor's route to uh, a career was to acquire. That was the really important thing. They did not have the time to edit. So you tended to realize you better edit yourself before it gets out of the house because once it's seen, it'll never be seen better. So I did run into that problem in working with Amber and that I'm not ready to hand something over right away. I have learned over this time, we've had, we had great fun, you know, in all, all, all kidding aside, we had great fun. We also had worked together in that we built this house together, we built our gardens together, we cooked together every day. Yeah. You know, we, we, you have certain, just give and take with each other. That made things easier as well. Um, and while I brought the knowledge of having spent my life writing novels, Amber brought a much deeper knowledge of the region that we were writing in. So she, you know, she was coming in every day with wonderful uh, facts and things that I didn't know. And also the final thing is, as she got used to the idea of writing a novel, as opposed to telling true stories or documentaries, she unleashed this imagination where repeatedly I would just be stunned. How did you think of it? How did that come to you? You know, so, you know, so I got to watch her grow in the process. Well, that, that's a great answer. Now, you, you, you obviously understand the nuts and bolts of writing novels and Amber, your filmmaker, credentials. I mean, did that did that help with the scenery? Your book is like Rana's in that the scenes are just so well laid out, especially the one that you read, you know, with the <laughs> river coming in and the boils and everything. So did your filmmaker's eye really contribute to that? Uh, well, I, I think so in that, I you know, it's now my habit to establish, it's like you're establishing shot. Where are we? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? Um, whose point of view, what, what, are we seeing this as like a wide shot? Are we seeing this as a, you know, close up? And uh, it just seemed like a, you know, what are they wearing? Um, it just seemed like a natural yeah. way for me to get into the story. Yeah, yeah, that, that really came through. It was just very well done. Now, Rana, you heard uh, Justin's uh, comments about how publishing has changed and you self-published A Noble Calling. Can you, can you tell me how you got to the point to where you uh, self-published? Um, I was very naive about the whole thing. I really wish I had um, done a little more research on the front end. As I said, I just turned around and started writing a book. And then when I finished the book in the summer of 2016, I um, sent the manuscript off to um, some beta readers, then made some changes, then sent it off to uh, 25 agents. Uh, my husband says I was a little overreaching. I chose the 25 top agents in the United States, didn't know any better, but got some wonderful feedback. Um, but part of the feedback I got was that they wanted a certain type of book that they could sell. And at that point in time, that's their business is selling books. A male FBI agent um, in a park wasn't what they were looking for. They wanted uh, me to change it to a woman. They wanted Wynn Tyler to be a woman. They wanted um, me to take out descriptions of the wildlife, cut down descriptions of the park. No one was interested in that, they thought. And most importantly, uh, they wanted all references to faith or Christianity or the character's faith out of there. And I went through with several very, very good agents. Uh, they wanted me to cut the book in half and we did rewrites, that sort of thing. And finally, a very good friend said, this is the book you wrote, you loved it. Just, just keep it your book. And so in 2020, right when the pandemic started, my timing was impeccable, uh, I hired a company and we published the book and I've been thrilled with, with how it turned out. So 
Um, the process was a little bit hard. I really um, was surprised a little bit about the industry. There was not a lot of feedback from um, the publishers or the agents and you would go months and really not get much feedback. So that's kind of where I was on it. It was a little, it was a little disconcerting. I was used to people responding back to you, being polite, that sort of thing. And nothing uh, against the people in Manhattan, but that was not the, that was not what I found, uh, even though these people were wonderful at, at their jobs. Right. And, and if you had taken out the scenery of the park or you had taken out the faith element, it would have been a totally different book. It would not be a noble calling. So I'm glad uh, that you uh, stayed strong in that regard because it, it is, like I said, just an excellent book. Now, uh, Justin and Amber talked about working as a husband wife team and you credit your husband, Bill, uh, the retired uh, FBI agent with uh, a lot of uh, the research and so forth. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, did you, you know, get to a scene and say, okay, how would the FBI handle this? Or did you say, hey, give me a scene that you, you know, the FBI has been involved in and I'll, you know, write the rest of it. How, how did that go for you working with your husband? Uh, Bill was wonderful. And uh, what I would do is, is write a chapter he would read it, and one of the things that were, was very important to both of us, since we were going to go forward with doing the book uh, back in 2017-18, was that the police part, the FBI part, the park ranger part be real. Um, and he would read them. I had several park rangers, including... Um, the uh, chief ranger at Yellowstone that helped me on some of those parts, the rescue parts in the book were sent to the park services main rescue park ranger who wow. teaches that all over the United States. He read those parts and made suggestions, but Bill was fabulous with the FBI portions and also connecting me to people with the hostage rescue team, people with uh, other parts of the FBI and other agencies, because there's other agencies involved in this, Secret Service and so forth, so that we can make that part of the book real. And that's, that's been a real, real positive thing. I've gotten so many emails and calls from FBI agents saying this is how it actually works. Yeah. And that's, that's very gratifying. That, that came through loud and clear for sure. Very, very believable. You know, for somebody who knows nothing about those tactics, it just came through loud and clear. Now, uh, Yellowstone Park is, is really a, a character in your book. So obviously Yellowstone holds a special place for you. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about that? Well, I think the, the, I'm from Arkansas, I grew up in Independence County, never got to travel really much as a kid or anything, but my mother always had a dream of going there. And in 2006, Bill and I took my mother, who was in a wheelchair, to Yellowstone National Park. And it was literally one of the best things I've ever done in my life, because it was a gift to her, but it was also a gift to all of us. And I was just entranced by the place. It was, it's just very otherworldly. And um, so that's probably, we've been back there five times since and been able to take friends and, and introduce them to the park, but it's just a wonderful place. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I've been one time and agree. Andre points out that uh, he loves the cats coming in and out of y'all scenery. Uh, at school, we have a school dog, so you may hear that uh, in the uh, background. Uh, Amber, you touched on this just a, a bit. Uh, you know, Yellowstone Park for Rana, you know, is a character uh, in 40 Days and 40 Nights. The Mississippi River, the Delta is really its, its own character. You touched on it. Can you go into a little bit more about what attracted you to creating a book that um, with uh, the Delta as the uh, location in it and the scenery and so forth? Uh, one of the things that always struck me when I was down there, and I've been going down to Dell in that area since I was uh, a, a, a child, is that um, the river plays such a, uh, an, an important role in the economy, transportation, it shapes the land, 
it, the floodplain, that alluvian soil. Um, it, it's like the central feature of life there, but you never see it. It is hidden behind these levees. And a lot of people can go their entire lives without ever casting eyes on that river, which is, I remember the first time I saw it, and I remember the first time I saw a levee that had a road on top of it, you know, you could drive along it. It's just, it's like, oh, I get it. And so we started doing a lot of research about the, uh, the flood of 1927, you know, the history, I didn't know all what the Army Corps of Engineers did, you know, of their, their mandate in terms of, of flood control. And um, so, and, and uh, can, I, can I say this, that our town, well, I'm gonna say it anyway. So uh, <laughs> Tomato, the, where Clementine comes from is a, was a real place. It was a real place near Dell. I remember the first time I saw that and you would see these, these little boy, I mean, there were sand boils exploding because they were right hard by the levee or outside the levee as they, as they called it. And it just seemed like, wow, what a great, you know, place and an unusual place that most people don't know about. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, those of us who live in a river town, you know, Little Rock has the Arkansas River running through it. You know, we feel like we have a little river water in our veins, you know, it's just <laughs> part of our bloodline. And so your descriptions of the Mississippi really ring true. You know, the Arkansas River doesn't flood quite like the Mississippi, obviously, but you know, there are some real threats there in your description of the boils, the, the crevasses. I mean, everything was just, just spot on. So I was glad to see that as just such a prominent character in the book. Good. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Ronna, uh, Wynn Tyler. Uh, Wynn Tyler is a young FBI agent. Uh, he is a great character. The dialogue is perfect for him. Uh, he obviously, he's a very believable character and lives a life that is, is different from yours. So how, do you, how did you create Wynn Tyler? Where did he come from? Um, that's a very good question. And I don't really know the answer other than um, he's what appeared on the paper. Um, he's probably um, a combination of a lot of people, a lot of um, influences in my life. He, uh, the character in the book uh, is 28 years old. He grew up in Heber Springs, Arkansas. He played football for the university. Uh, all of his friends thought he would go into pro football or work at a law firm after law school, but he decided he wanted a little adventure in his life. And the FBI offered that, a teamwork kind of environment with a little adventure. Uh, I think his main motive throughout is to do good. And that's one of the things he struggles with, whether his calling as a law enforcement officer is his actual calling in life. And he also struggles with faith. And I think most everybody has some struggle in their life, but there aren't that many protagonists in the thriller genre who maybe emphasize it as much as as we do in a noble calling? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, just a a great character, so believable. The dialogue is great. So, uh, same question for Justin and Amber Clementine Price. You know, again, just a, a wonderful character. Uh, it's it's just kind of fun to get into her skin and see what she's seeing. Is is she? based on somebody that you know or uh, where did you come up with clementine price we go <laughs> well, I, I would say among other things uh she's a tall amber <laughs> <laughs> is that okay to say <laughs> I, I don't i can't fly a plane i can't drive a boat and uh but, but, but if she cared to she could do it well that's what i found quite fascinating when i was when I would when I would read what Amber would write about her, uh, she uh, she was. It's in a big novel. It's wonderful wonderful to have a hero who can carry 
the story. The reader can believe I want to spend a long time with this person and hoping and praying for her solving the situation and for you know surviving. Uh, I think that she she certainly works in that respect. Um, the th it, we didn't start thinking about it, but she is above everything a natural caretaker. And she is therefore a natural public servant. She has a vision beyond just wanting to get the job. She has a vision of how the Mississippi River can be protected and managed and, and um, what would you say, given its, 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 given its best role? Yes, to, yeah. to work with nature rather than try to fight it. Um, and I think also, you know, Justin has written so many thrillers and um, the, the classic thriller situation is that usually it's a guy who parachutes into town to save the day. And I think one of the things that is, is so compelling about Clementine is that this is her town. She is a citizen of this community. She and all of her fellow citizens have to, you know, the public servants, and as Rana was talking about, the law enforcement, the, you know, the civil servants that we pay no attention to, you know, they are the ones who come together and, and save the day because it's Clementine has skin in the game. She's not an outside savior who will then just, you know, save the day and then ride out into the sunset. Yeah, well, very well said. Now, to the antagonist, you know, both uh, books have domestic terrorists uh, featured prominently, and obviously that's a really believable narrative uh, right now. Uh, and I want to explore a little bit about that uh, with uh, both books. So now, Justin, uh, you've written a lot of thrillers. Uh, why domestic terrorists this time around? I mean, it, how did how did that come to be? How did the the action, the conflict, a, come to be? It's a novel of the Mississippi River, which is to say, it's a novel of the American heartland. So I think what we needed was a challenge to the heartland that was absolutely real. Uh, harder to really get excited about uh, radical Muslims from the Middle East coming to the heartland to do something awful, as opposed to the great citizen hiding in plain sight. You know, yeah. the, in this, in the case of Nathan Flowers, you know, he is a he is a co-founder of a gigantic loved megachurch. Right. You know, and yeah. it made him that much scarier for the reader once they know that this is always there in the background, no matter what Clementine is trying to do and hoping to do, hope what she's trying to protect. What she doesn't even know at first is there's an even bigger threat than the natural threat. There is a threat of this local person, this man who's made really good and who's in a joyous marriage, has children, he's everything anyone would want to be in this world, and yet he has an entirely additional agenda that attacks the very world that he appears to be serving so well. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, when I read uh, a synopsis of the book, it said, you know, the villain is uh, hiding in plain sight. I thought, oh, here we go, you know, hiding in plain sight. But then, as you described, I mean, he is layered into the community and we all feel like we know somebody like that. And that did make it more frightening than, you know, radical Muslims uh, coming in or anything like that. It really did just add a wonderful touch to the book. Now, Rana, uh, same question for you. The militiamen in your book seems, uh, they seem like a group that we've seen in, in headlines today. Uh, what made you write them into your novel? The militiamen in the book would certainly not consider themselves domestic terrorism uh, or terrorists. <laughs> they, uh, they were uh, members of a church the prophet of the church uh, out there adjoining Yellowstone uh, was preaching a new America, felt like America uh, needed to uh, evolve, uh, 
uh, get rid of some of the international leadership. They were gonna start their own country out there. Um, and that is, um, they have a faith, um, they believe in God, they believe they are a part of what they used to call the Christian identity groups and part of the white supremacy groups took on some of that. Um, but these groups actually do exist. And um, so the villain in my book, who is a prophet, self-styled prophet, uh, he and Wynn certainly come to um, come to blows in a sense over uh, the twisting of Wynn's faith as he sees it. But uh, the prophet also has a uh, even more sinister agenda than just taking over the park, disrupting a Jewish monument dedication. Uh, I don't want to give too much away because it is a mystery, but um, but the villain uh, would not see himself as a domestic terrorist. He would see himself as a patriot. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the uh, recent events we've had in America, I've gotten so many comments about how did I write so much, so many of the things that actually happened. And I guess, um, I guess that's just part of, uh, part of writing about where we are in America. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Uh, you know, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, and that comes through very clear. You almost at times feel some sympathy for the militiamen. Like you can kind of get, you know, that these are normal guys who just took a really divergent path that has led them to terrible things. But uh, you make that clear that, that, you know, they were once normal law-abiding citizen. So I, I thought that was a great uh, part of your book. Now, Amber, uh, the, the Corps of Engineers doesn't really get a lot of press, uh, but your book made me kind of uh, re rethink their importance, you know, uh, the vital battles that they, that they fight. Now, can uh, you and Justin speak a little bit about your research? It is very thorough into the locks and dams and causeways and levees and so forth. How, how, how did that part all come together for you? The, the Corps is, uh, the Corps has for a hundred years waged two, two basic battles. One is against the flooding of the Mississippi, you know, and the other is a public relations battle to convince the people of the Mississippi Valley that the Corps is not merely an occupying army. And it, it, you know, it's a very interesting situation. Our United States Army does not, is not allowed to operate inside the American borders with one major exception, which for obvious reasons is the Army Corps of Engineers. They are the, the protector and builder of a gigantic infrastructure to attempt to keep people safe. But as soon as you're going to build anything, you're also going to be getting in the way of people. And as one of the uh, characters you know, mentions in, is that you, you have all these competing forces, all of whom want something different from the core and they want something, you know, something different from the core. Um, so the, the, the core therefore has done a beautiful job of publicizing what it does it publishes all sorts of papers on every single aspect of the work it does. And we were able to mine them to try to understand this difficult to understand, difficult to understand well enough to write about. Because our job, of course, is to then write about it so that you can easily understand it. You know, not have to you know, go to a lot of trouble. And the reason that the core became the keeper of our, our, our rivers and our, our infrastructure. And especially, you know, we like to say that the core of the core is the Mississippi Valley Division because there's nothing more challenging than that the whole stretch from, you know, Minnesota to New Orleans. Um, but, you know, they also, they are incredibly interwoven with civilians. So many of the people who work with them are civilian contractors, civilian experts. The vast majority. And, and the reason they became in charge of this huge effort is because of the flood of 1927, which 
happened, you know, in a time when every little district had their own levy system, every county, every town, and simply it's like, pass it on. Let's build a, a high levy here and just pass the water on down. So, and they didn't care what was going on in the next state or in the next um, county. So the Army Corps had to come in and say, this is a national waterway. This is a national situation and we have to have a national uniform solution. And- um, So they became the mediator and therefore director of the entire system. Right, and uh, you, you you took uh, uh, lengths to explain that, you know, sometimes the Corps is viewed as an occupying force by the locals, which is something that I hadn't thought of, uh, but the natural conflict uh, between the Corps and locals came through in your book, which I thought was, was an excellent part as well. Now, Rana, uh, a noble calling. When you said you sat down and wrote basically chapter one, uh, did it surprise you at all? Did the book uh, surprise you in any way? Where it went, how it went, anything like that? It surprised me in most every way um, <laughs> because I don't consider myself a writer. Uh, I spent a lot of years writing technical work with appraisals. Um, when my assistant sat down and read that first day's effort, uh, she said, you've got to write the story. So uh, I continued my 60, 70 hour a week job for uh, two, three more years before I retired and just dabbled in writing. But I think the biggest thing that has surprised me um, was how the book can write itself in a sense. It's almost like the character is writing the scene. I did not make an outline. I wrote the... Um, the first chapter that day, probably later that week, I wrote the ending of the book. I wrote the book in, in scenes and I literally printed the whole thing off and cut and paste with literally scissors and uh, scotch tape and put it together in some semblance of order, then filled it in. And that's how I wrote the book. Um, I just finished the manuscript um, this week for the second book, which is um, part of the same series. And I was a little more organized in uh, that second, uh, second attempt. But um, I think the biggest thing that surprised me has been all the awards that the book has won. I didn't expect that at all. Um, that's been, again, very gratifying. And and also very humbling because um, it, it was an effort of, at love in doing the book and it's meant to honor the people, the park rangers, the FBI agents, all those people who are there that we don't think about every day. Mm. They're literally putting their lives on the line for us and for the country. T tell us about those awards real quick. Um, the book was given the Bill Fisher Award for first best novel for the Independent Publishing Association. Uh, it also uh, has won a finalist on the Eric Hoffer Award. It was for commercial fiction. It has won um, in the Indie Awards. It was best Christian fiction and best action adventure and a finalist for best thriller for 2021. And then it's been named recently a finalist for the Christie Award, which is the top contemporary Christian novel award. Um, I did not write the book as Christian fiction per se, but I think it goes back again to what's being published and there is not a lot of faith-based or faith uh, within a lot of the thriller genre right now. So um, that's been a surprise to me that, that the book has been put in those categories. Well, congratulations on, on those awards. All, Thank uh, you. all of them well-earned for sure. Uh, Justin and Amber, same question. How did uh, 40 Days and 40 Nights surprise you guys? I was surprised by... Um some of the uh, church sermons we wrote. <laughs> I, you know, I noticed that. They were really well done. 
<laughs> and we Southerners know this kind of thing. So. <laughs> I was, I was also surprised when one day Amber came downstairs with the uh, uh, rap sermons. <laughs> and no, not just a number. It wasn't a whole sermon, but it was a rap. It, it was rap it, church. It, yeah, it was. It yeah. was. A, it was a faith rap show. We said yeah. several of them, and uh, I. I I was surprised on, on numerous levels, uh, including the fact that it's rare that you beat somebody who actually can can rap. <laughs> Anybody can <fight. laughs> so that, that was that was that was a very nice surprise. I, I was um, impressed by that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I concur with with Rana in that. Um, you know, I have heard in my entire life. I was an English major, and I know a number of writers, and of course Justin. Um, and they always say that their characters talk, characters talk to them. And I thought that was the biggest cliche, but damn if it's not true. I mean, it is like, sometimes it's like taking dictation and you just say, well, I don't know, I'm like, okay, sure. That's what you're saying. Um, it, there is this, this sense of, if you, know, if you know your characters well enough, they will tell you what they will and won't do. And you, it, you just sort of feel like you have, you know, fallen in love with all these people. Yeah. yeah that's, that's so, nice. that's so true. That is so true. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Hey, uh, Rana, a question from Susan. She wants to know if the park service embraced your book and if Yellowstone has it in their available in their bookstores. Uh, Yellowstone did not take any new fiction this year because of the pandemic. Uh, it was selected to go into the, the bookstores as one of the finalists for their three or four. They only take three or four new fiction uh, novels each year. And then they elected to go with, I guess, inventory they had from last year. But my hope is it will be in there next year and it is available at all other bookstores and of Great. course, Amazon and online. Great. Uh, we have about four minutes left. So I wanna ask you both about what comes next. Now, Rana, uh, this is a series. Is it, it, Tell us a little bit, just give us a teaser about what's coming next and uh, are Bill's experiences gonna be anywhere in the series and so forth? Well, uh, Bill's experiences are in the series more as, oh my gosh, the Bureau wouldn't do that or he wouldn't <laughs> say that or that sort yeah. of thing. And, and as these, um, uh, Mr. Edwards and uh, Mr. Scott and Ms. Edwards, uh, they are, they've written so much they know it's so gratifying to type the end on something which happened on my second novel last monday so that manuscript is being cleaned up and uh, lord willing that'll be published this winter so um the the characters are some of the same still in yellowstone but also in eastern russia so, and strangely enough, it revolves around a missing woman in a national park. <laughs> All right. So, ripped from the headlines. Uh, there exactly. you go. There you go. Uh, Justin and Amber, are we going to see Clementine again? Or what do you think? You are indeed. Um, Great. You're going to see her in a novel called Buying the Farm. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Any teaser you can give us or... Uh, well, we, we've gone true to life. We've gone from flood to drought. <laughs> okay. I like it. Well, I'll look forward to that. <laughs> and and we're, going to, we're going to meet uh, Clementine's ghosts. Okay. Very interesting. Well, good. Well, listen, I enjoyed both books. We are out of time. 40 days and 40 nights and a noble calling. Both of them just wonderful books, very much well worth the read. Take the time to pick them up. I can assure you, you'll enjoy both. Justin and Amber, thank you for coming in from Connecticut. Thank Rana, you. good to see you. You're just down the road, but still yes. uh, uh, good to see you. I hope I run into you soon. And thank you all for joining us on the Six Bridges Book Festival. We have a whole lot of other authors that are featured over the next several days, so please join. 
uh, any that you can. It's a, it's been a just a great festival so far, and we look forward to more. So thank you all for joining us. That's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.